Mr Speaker, earlier this week, this House marked the one-year anniversary of the horrific attacks on October the 7th, and I take this opportunity to reiterate that the hostages must be released, and I reiterate our call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and Lebanon. Mr Speaker, this week the Government will deliver on our promise to the British people of the biggest upgrade to workers' rights in a generation. The Employment Rights Bill will ensure work pays, it will forge a new partnership with business and reset the dreadful industrial relations that have cost our economy and our NHS so much in recent years. We are also preparing for the International Investment Summit next week, bringing hundreds of global CEOs to the UK and unlocking billions of pounds in investment. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The commitment of £400 million in funding for a new hospital at Watford General was one of the many brilliant things of the previous Conservative Government. Yeah. And my good friend, the former Member of Parliament for uh, Watford, Dean Russell, did, and would have been life-changing as well as life-saving so, for so many of my constituents. Why is the Prime Minister cancelling this funding commitment and spending billions of pounds giving pay rises to train drivers yeah. instead? Yeah. Because the promise of 40 new hospitals didn't involve 40, didn't involve hospitals, they weren't new and they weren't funded. One of the biggest issues in my West Bromwich constituency is poor access to GP services. Our GP satisfaction rate is 15% below the national average. So can I thank the Government for their focus on improving this situation and ask the Prime Minister what the Government's doing to make sure that everyone in West Bromwich can actually see their GP? Well, I thank her for her question. The most visible sign of failure of the last Government was the NHS. We are going to expand the role of community pharmacies and accelerate the rollout of independent prescribers. We need much more care to be delivered in local communities to spot problems earlier, and we'll train thousands more GPs. We were elected to change the country, and that means getting the NHS back on its feet. And my hon. Friend, the Chancellor, will have much more to say about that in the Budget, about fixing the foundations of our economy so we can put money in people's pockets, fix our public services and rebuild Britain. Leader of the Opposition, Rishi Sunak. Mr Speaker, tomorrow the Government will publish their anticipated changes to employment law. Given the weekend's events, given the weekend's events, when did the Prime Minister first become a convert to fire and rehire? pleased and proud that tomorrow, tomorrow we will publish the bill which will be the biggest upgrade of workers' rights in a generation. And that will do two things, Mr Speaker. Firstly, it will give people basic dignity at work. And secondly, it will help grow our economy, something that the last government absolutely failed on for 14 long years. The opposition. Well, Mr Speaker, when he talks about security at work, once again, it's one rule for him and another rule for everyone else. Yeah. But I know that not I know that not everything I know that not everything or everyone has survived his first hundred days in government. So can he confirm that when he promised not to raise income tax, national insurance or VAT, that commitment applies to both employer and employee national insurance contributions? Yeah. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, as he well knows, I'm not going to get drawn on decisions that will be set out. We made an absolute commitment in relation to not raising tax on working people. He, of course, was the expert's expert on raising taxes. Yeah. And what did we get in return for it? We got a broken economy, broken public services and a £22 billion black hole in the economy. We're here to stabilise the economy and we will do so. Mr Speaker, I don't think even Lord Ali is buying any of that nonsense. But I'm not, but I'm not asking, Mr Speaker, I'm not, I'm not asking about the budget. 
I'm not asking about the budget. I'm asking specifically. I'm asking specifically. I'm asking specifically about the promise he made to the British people. So let me ask him again, just to clarify his own promise. Does his commitment not to raise national insurance apply to both employee and employer national insurance contributions? We set out our promises in our manifesto. We returned with a huge majority to change the country for the better. And I stick to my promises in the manifesto. But I notice it's question three, and it hasn't yet welcomed the investment into this country. We've had in recent months £8 billion from Amazon for jobs across the country, £10 billion from Blackstone's jobs across the North East, £22 billion on carbon capture, jobs in the North East and the North West, £500 million, Mr Speaker, for UK buses in Northern Ireland. Well, we're investing in our economy. What are they doing? They are arguing about whether to scrap maternity pay. Leader of the Opposition. Oh, Mr Speaker, I am very happy to welcome investments that this Government negotiated. But when it comes, when it comes, to, his answer, when it comes to his answer on tax, Mr Speaker, Businesses across the country would have found his answer just about as reassuring as Sue Gray did when he promised to protect her job, Mr Speaker. So let me turn. It's no wonder confidence is plummeting on his watch, which he didn't mention. But turning to another commitment, before the election, his Chancellor said changing the debt target in the fiscal rules would be tantamount to fiddling the figures. Does he still agree with the Chancellor? Prime Minister... This is literally the man who was in charge of the economy. Fourteen years they crashed the economy. And what did, what did they leave? A £22 billion black hole in the economy. Unlike them, we won't walk past it, we will fix it, and it's only because we're stabilising the economy that we are getting the investment into this country. But I still notice he hasn't really talked about that investment. We're powering ahead with clean British energy. We're changing the rules to build 1.5 million homes and returning railways to public ownership. And they've got nothing to say about any of this. Mr Speaker, on debt, we left them the second lowest debt in the G7, Mr Speaker. And as the Institute, as the Institute of Fiscal Studies, as the Institute of Fiscal Studies have said, with order, 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 order. I will hear the leader of the opposition. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as the Institute of Fiscal Studies have said, it's hard to escape the suspicion that the government is attracted to this change because it would allow for significantly more borrowing. Now, his Chancellor previously said that this change, and I quote her words, would be fiddling the figures. So it is a simple question. Does he still agree with the Chancellor? Prime Minister. Uh, I see it's back to his old script. They've never had it so good. That didn't work so well at the uh, election party. might be time to change that. Uh, I'm not going to get drawn on issues for the budget, just as, just as he wouldn't when he was standing at this dispatch box. But meanwhile, we're investing, we're building the NHS fit for the future back on its feet, better opportunities for young people and protections at work. After 14 years of Tory failure, we're giving the country its future back. And that's the difference that Labour delivers. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, it is clear he's opened the door to raising employer national insurance contributions, including on pensions, and fiddling the figures that he can borrow more. And he talks about what he's achieved. Well, economic confidence is plummeting, growth is now stalling, and the UK's borrowing costs are rising on his watch, Mr Speaker. But, look, Mr Speaker, can I close on another important topic? Because yesterday's intervention from the head of MI5 will have been sobering for the whole House and not least his warning that Britain faces the most complex and interconnected threats in our country's history. Now, I know the Prime Minister will agree with me that we all owe our security services a debt of gratitude for what they do to keep us safe. Uh, but can the Prime Minister confirm that the forthcoming terrorism bill will give our security services the powers they need to tackle evolving threats? And I can assure him of our constructive support on these vital questions of national security in the same spirit that he provided that support to me. Prime Minister. Well, I can confirm that we will give the security forces uh, and services the powers that they need, um, and I hope that is a shared objective across the House. They do an incredibly important job 
um, for us. But he talks about the economy. It's a real shame the party opposite can't simply. Well, he did at the beginning of his question a moment ago. Listen on. It's a shame they can't celebrate Britain's success under this government. Of course, we've got to take tough decisions. But when investment is pouring in, as it has been in recent weeks, when the NHS strikes are coming to an end, when houses are getting built, we're delivering the biggest upgrade of workers' rights in a generation. It's time for them to accept that we're fixing the foundations. So whilst they fight amongst themselves in the comfort zone of unfunded promises, threatening to scrap the minimum wage, we're going to get on with the job of clearing up the mess that they made and fighting a better country that people are crying out for. Adam Jogan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, cancer is hard on the patient and it's hard on their families, as my family knows all too well this year. Can I ask the Prime Minister to commit to doing all he can to improve research, early diagnosis and patient care for those with cancer? And will he join me in thanking the NHS staff who've looked after my dad in recent weeks and thousands of cancer patients like him in Newcastle and Lyme and up and down our United Kingdom? I I was sorry to hear about my honourable friend's father, and I think we would all pass him uh, our best wishes. Cancer is another example of the dreadful state the last government left the NHS in. The Darcy report published just a few weeks ago showed that some cancer standards have not been met since 2015, and no progress was made in diagnosing cancer at stage one and stage two between 2013 and 2021. So I'm really pleased that we've just announced £6.4 million research network developing new AI software to identify cancer early. We will get the NHS catching cancer on time, diagnosing it earlier and treating it faster. Yeah. Leader of the Liberal Democrats, Shred Davy. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Across this House, we all agree that we need to get our economy growing strongly again so we can improve people's lives and raise the money for our public services. Liberal Democrats believe that one of the best ways of doing that is to improve our relationship with our European neighbours on things like trade, and I welcome the fact that the Prime Minister has made this a priority in his first few weeks. But what I just don't understand is that he's ruled out negotiating a youth mobility scheme with our European partners. This could be so good for young people, for businesses, and for re-establishing that relationship. So will he reconsider this? Prime Minister. Well, he's right. We do need a better deal with the EU than the bad deal we got under the last government. Uh, And that's why I was very pleased to meet the President of the Commission last week um, to talk about how we can improve on the deal. In our manifesto, we had clear red lines about the single market, customs union, freedom of movement, and we will negotiate uh, with those red lines in place. David. Well, I'm disappointed about the youth mobility scheme. Maybe we can come back to that. But he's right to say one of the many problems for our economy coming from the dreadful Brexit deal was the red tape that's been put on businesses. Now, there are many examples of that, uh, Mr Speaker, but a new example came to me earlier this week, and it affects fishermen uh, in the Falklands who are otherwise having to pay huge amounts in tariffs to be able to sell, to, to be able to se- to, to be able to sell their produce into the European market or sail under a Spanish flag. So when the Prime Minister renegotiates the trade deal, can you remember the overseas territories? And, and, and ensure that British citizens fishing off the Falklands can sail proudly under the Union Jack. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. My uncle nearly lost his life when his ship was torpedoed defending the Falklands. They are British and they will remain British. Yeah. And sovereignty in Gibraltar is equally not to be negotiated. Of course, we will do everything we can to make it easier for all businesses to trade more freely so that we can grow our economy. I'm very, very clear about the Falklands. It's personal to me. John Pearce. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Conservative-led Derbyshire County Council are proposing to cut adult day centres and care homes across Derbyshire. Yeah. Yeah. My constituent, Pat, was diagnosed with dementia in 2016. The Jubilee Centre in New Mills is a lifeline for her and her family. She always returns happier, less confused and less anxious. 
and for her partner David and main carer, it provides vital respite while she's there. They do not know how they'll survive without it. Will the Prime Minister join with me in asking the Conservatives on Derbyshire County Council to think again and oppose these devastating cuts to older people and their families? Well, I'm, I'm shocked to hear of the impact on Derbyshire Council uh, that he's just described to a proposing cutbacks on adult social care. Uh, and councils across the country were at the front line of the last government's ruinous economic failure. And it's left people who rely on services counting the cost. Now, there's no quick fix to this, but we will provide councils with more stability and certainty through multi year funding settlements, ensuring councils can plan their finances for the future properly. And we will work with local leaders to deliver this. Stop. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Any sense of unease? that though he is the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, there are over 300 areas of law in Northern Ireland where the legislation is made in a foreign parliament. Has the Prime Minister any ambition of recovering UK sovereignty over those 300 areas of law and thereby restoring the equal citizenships of my constituents and ending their disenfranchising in respect of making laws that govern much of their economy. Prime Minister, I, I thank you for raising that issue, which of course is an important issue. The Windsor framework was negotiated by the last government. We supported it, and we continue to support it, uh, and will work to make sure it's implemented properly and fully. Dave McHillier. Mr Speaker, one in two children in my constituency live in poverty after housing costs are taken into account, so I welcome the Government's commitment to tackling child poverty. But we all know that every year of poverty has a long-term impact, so could the Prime Minister tell us that the Welcome Child Poverty Task Force, which is underway, could he tell us when he expects that to report so we can see action? Well, I, I thank my honourable friend for our important question. It is appalling that child poverty went up 700,000 since 2010. Uh, and after the last Labour government did so much to bring it down. And tackling this is at the heart of our mission to break down the barriers to opportunity. The task force um, is developing the strategy to reduce child poverty, and it will be published in spring of next year. Shivanda Rajik. The Prime Minister's decision to impose VAT on independent schools strips hard-working families of the choice for what is best for their children, while risking job losses for teachers, increasing class sizes and squeezing state school resources to their absolute limit. With these impending threats, what actions is the Prime Minister taking to mitigate these effects if he is not undertaking an impact assessment to understand them? I do understand that many parents across the country save hard to be able to send their children to private school because they have aspiration for their children. So does every parent who sends their children to a state school. And the problem we have is we don't have enough teachers in key subjects in our state secondary school. Now, the, the party opposite may be prepared to tolerate that. I'm not. Uh, and that's why we've made this change to fund 6,500 teachers. Uh, and they chunter on. But they have to answer the question, they, which none of them are answering. If they're not going to make this change, are they going to leave our state secondaries without the teachers they need? Or are they going to cut the education budget by £1.5 billion? Which is it? Mr Speaker, Gloucester has a proud military history from the Battle of Imjin River to RAF Quedgley and the Glorious Gloucesters. In fact, almost 10% of Gloucester households are home to a veteran. So can the Prime Minister update this House on what this Government is doing to support veterans, in particular how he will meet his promise to make sure that every veteran in Gloucester has a roof over their head? Yeah. Prime Minister, we owe an enormous debt to all of our veterans, um, and it was a great honour to announce at our party conference that our plans to build new homes across the country will ensure that homeless veterans are at the front line of the queue for new social housing, recognise the incredible sacrifice and contribution that they make. 
We will repay all those who served us and house all veterans in housing needs, ensuring homes are there for heroes. We are also ensuring veterans have access to support, including with mental health and employment. Sir Julian Smith. Mr Speaker, special yeah. education needs budgets in North Yorkshire and across the UK are under huge uh, pressure. Could I ask the Prime Minister and uh, the Chancellor, as they prepare for the budget, uh, could they look carefully at how increased funding and changes to the funding formula could make a massive difference to thousands of lives of children across the country? Well, well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for raising this issue, which is of real concern across the country uh, to many parents um, who are concerned about the provision. And I do agree that children with special educational needs and disabilities are being failed, uh, with parents struggling to get their children the support that they need and deserve. And we have to change that. I'm determined to raise standards for every child so they succeed in education. And we will work with the sector and across the House where we can to deliver on that mission, which is very important for many parents who will be watching this today. Look, Murphy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can I welcome the Prime Minister's focus on economic growth, and I look forward to the International Investment Summit next week. One area where constituents across the country want to see thrive is their local high street, and the Prime Minister will know from his own visit to the top of town in Basingstoke that it has huge potential, that it has huge potential uh, but it is not what it could be. Could I ask the Prime Minister what support this Government will give to ensure that high streets across the country are able to grow and thrive? Well, I do remember that visit, and here's the new political vibe. Invest with Labour or decline with the Tories. And that's why I was very pleased to read out the investments we've had in the last few weeks. We've got a big summit coming up on Monday, hundreds of CEOs coming, and I'm confident we'll be making further such investment announcements in weeks to come. And that is what will fix our economy, stabilise our economy. It's because we're taking the tough decisions. The investment is now coming, flowing into this country, fulfil on our obligation to raise living standards across the country. Helen Morgan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, the A483 runs through my constituency from Hlanamanuk to Oswestry, and it's one of the busiest and most dangerous roads in the constituency. And National Highways say that the crossroads at Hlunkless is the worst accident black spot in the Midlands. They've got a proposal to improve the situation, but Treasury rules place a higher value on road speed than they do on the lives of North Shropshire's yeah. residents. Yeah. So will the Prime Minister look at flexing these rules to back national highways and back my residents to give them the safe road they deserve? Prime Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Member for raising this, and it's obviously a really big, important issue in her constituency. Um, and it is vital that as we invest, we do improve safety. Um, and deliver better journeys for drivers. Um, National Highways, I think, is continuing to study uh, the case for safety improvements to the A483 um, and will continue to do so. Um, decisions, as she probably knows, will be set out under the third road investment strategy. And I know that the Roads Minister will have heard her representations and I'm sure uh, will agree to a meeting if that is what you'd like. Phil Brickle. <laughs> Bolton Hospice provides vital services to individuals with life-limiting conditions. Yet, like hospices across the country, it faces a difficult financial future and is reliant on fundraising, including the kind donations I was able to raise when I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro last year. Yeah. Yeah. And from the campaign run by the local paper, The Bolton News. Can the Prime Minister tell me what steps he is taking to ensure hospices like the one in Bolton are put on a sustainable financial footing? Yeah. Uh, well, look, can I first um, congratulate him on his uh, efforts uh, in relation to the local hospice? Um, we want everyone to have access to high quality care uh, and end of life care. Um, and that is why we require all local NHS bodies to commission services from hospices to meet the needs of their local populations. Most hospices are charitable, independent organisations who also receive funding for providing NHS services. We have inherited a huge problem with the £22 billion yeah. black hole, yeah. but nonetheless, we are determined to move forward on this. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, since the signing of the Belfast Agreement in 1998, more people in Northern Ireland have now sadly lost their lives to suicide than those that were killed during the 30 years of the Troubles. 
Would the Prime Minister agree that the challenges with poor mental health in Northern Ireland, some of which are directly related to the violence of our past, is a unique and pressing legacy of the Troubles? So would he therefore commit to tasking his government to work collaboratively with the Department of Health in Northern Ireland to explore how these issues can be properly recognised and resolved? Question, Mr. Well, I thank him for raising this um, important issue. Um, uh, I, I do know firsthand the deep impact that the Troubles have had on so many uh, in Northern Ireland. And we must ensure that those with mental health issues receive the support and the care that they need. Now, public services obviously devolved in Northern Ireland, but we will work uh, with the executive and leaders to support them in delivering better outcomes, uh, which is why my Secretary of State for Health spoke to the Health Minister in Northern Ireland in the first week uh, he was in the department. Uh, and I'm sure that he'd be prepared to follow up should the Honourable Member wish so. Joe Morris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In my constituency of Hexham, uh, frightened parents and their families having to fight tooth and nail uh, and travel extremely long distances to secure fair treatment and full education for their children. Um, can the Prime Minister outline the steps that the Government will take to improve outcomes and results for SEND families, particularly in the most rural parts of the North East? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, I thank him for his question. I think this reinforces that um, the SEND provisions um, were a failure of the last government, particularly in rural communities. This has come from both sides of the House. It's a really important issue. We have a duty now to pick this up uh, and to ensure that all children with SEND receive the right support to succeed in their education, and we will continue to do so. David Davis. On the assisted dying private members' bill, the government is quite rightly staying neutral. But the real issue with that bill is the time constraints of private legislation make it very difficult to get it right first time. If we get this wrong first time, the consequences are too terrible to contemplate. In 1967, the government of the day gave the government time to allow David Steele's abortion bill to go through. Would the, the Prime Minister commit to giving extra time out of government time to this bill to ensure that we get this right first time? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, I thank him for raising this question on a really important um, issue. And I do understand there are strongly held views um, across uh, the House and, and with, uh, on both sides and within both sides, if I can put it in that way. Um, I do agree with him that it is important um, that we ensure that any change to the law, if there is to be one, is effective. Now, if this House gives the Bill a second reading, it will, of course, then go to the committee uh, as usual, which will allow that more detailed um, scrutiny. But um, we do need the discussion uh, more broadly uh, on this important issue. No law. With shared prosperity funding drawing to a close and Cornwall having some of the greatest potential in Europe in critical minerals and renewable energy, it's time for our aspiring Celtic Tiger to identify much more strategic uh, sources of investment funding which take us away from the short-termist begging bowl politics of the last decade. Yes. Will the Prime Minister meet with the Cornish MPs to discuss the future of industrial and social funding in Cornwall? Yeah. 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 Minister. Well, my honourable friend is a proud Cornish uh, MP and is absolutely right that economic growth must be spread across the country. It cannot simply be focused in the South East and London. And he'll have seen uh, today, no doubt, the floating offshore wind task force report, which sets out that the UK's industry can support tens of thousands of jobs, including huge opportunities, uh, job opportunities in the South West. And I will ensure that a meeting is arranged with him, uh, with the appropriate minister. When did Chamberlain? that affects thousands of children potentially across the UK. I first raised it in this chamber 18 months ago when I heard about the devastating impact from a constituent. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it should not be for a charity to fund the pathway eh, analysis and research that is needed to ensure that people and children get the support that they need? And will he help facilitate a meeting for me with the charity and the Department for Health? Prime Minister. Well, can I first thank her for raising this important um, issue and reminding the House of the impact that it has. And certainly, I think uh, I can arrange that meeting so that we can take that further forward. Thank you. Mary Kelly Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Constituents in the City of Durham are anxious about the financial situation at Durham County Council. The Tories' unfair funding formula has seen essential public services hollowed out, such as social care, whilst the demand is increasing. So what assurances can the Prime Minister give me that essential services will be restored and that a new funding formula will be genuinely a fair one, focusing on the needs of my constituents, especially the most vulnerable. Prime Minister. Well, she highlights yet another failing of the last government, because successive years of underfunding have left councils experiencing significant budget pressures, and that's felt by constituents and residents and individuals across the country. This government will clear up the mess, will get councils back on their feet. Partly, multi-year funding settlements will help to allow longer-term uh, work to be done. But we recognise the importance of councils. They know their communities best, and with greater stability, we can support them in ensuring the services that they provide get to the people that need it. Yeah. 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 Over 50 homes and businesses in Gosport found themselves underwater when Storm Pyrrhic hit. Some have still not been able to return to their properties, and it's now been upgraded to a one in 20 year risk. We still haven't had a decision from the Environment Agency about flood and coastal erosion risk management funding, which we've applied for. And despite requests, I still haven't been able to secure a meeting with his DEFRA team. Winter is coming. My constituents are worried. When is he going to grip this? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, look, this is a really important issue um, uh, in terms of. Well, uh, look, we're not going to take lessons from the party opposite. Year after year after year, uh, we visited constituencies uh, and areas which were flooded because there had been a failure to take adequate protection. So I won't take lectures. What I said in the election campaign is that we would set up a, a flood resilience task force to get ahead of this. We will do that, and I'll ensure that she can get such further information as she needs. Don Butler, final question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. October is Black History Month and the theme this year is Reclaiming the Narrative. I want to thank Mr Speaker for the event that you will be doing uh, in your apartments with The Temptations um, and uh, the Prime Minister. <laughs> the Temptations tribute band and, uh, and the Prime Minister will be having an event in number 10 uh, this evening. Will the Prime Minister agree with me that it's important that we continue to have a debate on the floor of this House in Government's time on Black History Month? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, I'm not sure just at the moment uh, going to something that's labelled temptations is uh, quite where I need to go. Uh, but uh, but uh, look, this is a really important initiative. Uh, there will be. Um, it is important it's being marked, and I'm very pleased to be hosting the event this evening, to which I think she is coming. Thank you. Right, that completes Prime Minister's questions.